Welcome everyone to our second session of Mujeres Hispanas y Tipografía, part two. I am Lavinia Lascaris, the exhibition and graphic designer at Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography. And here with me is Jimena Maya. Hi everyone, I'm Jimena Maya. I'm the graphic designer at the HMCT. We're very excited to share this series that Lavinia, Laishi and myself curated together. And the lineup covers type design, editorial design, and breaking ground with technology and how graphic design and typography reflect on the state of our society. So now uh, let us introduce our host, Laishi Curbelo. Laishi is a designer that specializes in user experience and accessibility. She is a communication educator of Talk Their Language and provides communication training to companies and designers in both corporate and private levels. Um, she is a design advocate and CEO of Command Z, an international podcast about design, tech, and communication with episodes in Spanish and English. Um, we are very excited about the series and so grateful to everyone who agreed to be part of it. Um, Laishi will pass it on to you to introduce our guests and see you at the end for the Q&A. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much Lavinia and Jimena for that amazing presentation. Uh, welcome everybody, it depends on your geographical location, buenos dias or buenas tardes. My name is Leishi Curbelo, as Lavinia and Jimena present myself. Um, I'm from the beautiful island of Puerto Rico, where in every part of the day and the month and in the year, it's always summer. Super happy to have the opportunity today to present these amazing speakers. Uh, today, I have the honor to presenting two Venezuela amazing designers who will be sharing their work and knowledge with us. So I really love how your work transcend aesthetical through time. And I think that was something that grabbed my attention, where typography allows you to understand in which time period you want to the reader be positioned. Uh, with us today, we have Faride Mareb. He's an art director, book designer, researcher, and educator based on New York City. Her STEM achievements such as 10 out 10 research grant on photo books by women support her research on ongoing collaborative projects bringing Latin America and Europe through her design studio and publishing press, Letra Muerta. Also join Faride, we will have Oriana Nusi. Oriana is a designer with a background in photography and visual arts. She's a participant in several groups of exhibitions such as Cuerpo en Cuestión with Art Nexus and Practicas versus Teore Teoreticas. Her work comments on themes of the body, power, and femininity, and she believes on pursuing bookmaking and poetry as a form of resistance. So without further ado, or speakers of the day, Faride and Oriana, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the stage, well, the virtual stage. <laughs> thank you. Um, we're going to share our screen. So uh, first of all, we want to thank Jimena and Lavinia for the invitation. Laishi, thank you for presenting us. Um, we were practicing this presentation several times to see how we were going to do this because we usually present uh, individually. So what we came we came to the conclusion that this might look a little bit like a preschool presentation going back and forth between one another. We'll try to make it good. work. We'll try to yeah. make it work. Uh, and we're basically focusing on five projects. We're doing a little bit of an overview uh, of the work we do. But we're going to focus on the layout, typography, and um, typographic styles of five books. So Letra Muerta began in 2014 as a publishing house in Venezuela. And from 2014 to 2018, about five books were published. Uh, those books were all printed at Ex Libris Publishing House. And in March 2018, I migrated to the U.S., where I started working for different companies. I migrated in 2019, just before before the pandemic hit. Yeah, not a very good uh, time for that. But I continued working in branding as a freelancer with other projects. And in 2021, I met Paride uh, through Twitter. We were chatting that in the in the uh, earlier, <laughs> and I started collaborating with her on projects, including some of Letra Muertos. From the, from the first time, or maybe well, the second, I don't even, I don't remember very well, uh, we discovered many things in common that was like st stunning, honestly. But the most important was the sensitivity towards the book. 
uh, as an as an object uh, that dialogues with a lot of elements uh, and its relevance in culture through arts and literature. And if you see here, this is an attempt, and I say attempt because this is really crooked. I was trying to make it look the map of Venezuela, make it look like a bad brains album cover, but I failed a little bit. Um, on one side, you see Maracaibo, which is where Oriana is from. And on the other side, you see Valencia, where I'm from. So we're from very different, far away parts of the country. And we ended up meeting in the US. Um, Thanks to Suleika. Agosta. Agosta, yeah. Very successful Puerto Rican stylist who we share this space with. We were able to create uh, our studio. And this is a col collaborative uh, space in Los Sures, uh, a neighborhood in Williamsburg, in the heart of Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And last month we turned a year. <laughs> it's crazy uh, to think of ourselves as um, being a year already. We started just the two of us and now there's two other fantastic women working uh, on our team, uh, there's Daniela Spector, a photographer and an archivist, and Paola Senseve, a Bolivian poet. So this is, sometimes we call this the Women Empowerment Center <laughs> as a joke because everybody's, you know, doing their own thing. Uh, something that's really important to mention is that the economic model in the U.S. Um, is very different than the one in Latin America. So one of the things that keeps us afloat and going forward is making the space function as an archive center. Um, we also host events and art shows, and we mostly, our bread and butter is design. So we still publish books, but our day-to-day -day is, you know, working as designers. Yeah. So a little bit about my background, um, again, <laughs> uh, I have a bachelor's degree in graphic design. I have studied, as you heard before, photography and visual arts and participated in many exhibitions and col collaborative art projects related with art education in low-income communities. And, and besides that, my work uh, and research is of, it's mostly or mainly uh, about femininity through video performance, installation, and poetry. Yeah, and on my end, I don't wanna to talk too much, but one of the things that made us coincide, is, like she said about our sensitivities is that I also, I uh, had an artistic practice. Most of the work I did was regarding installation with typography as a concept and the intervention of books. And I also studied under Javier Aispuro, a, a printer with many years of experience that founded the publishing house Ex Libris in Venezuela, which is one of the publishing houses with the one of the richest and longest history of Venezuelan uh, publishing. So that's a little bit of how we came to be. Yeah. So these are some of the books that we have worked on at Letra Muerta. From book one to book five, all of those were published in Venezuela. And book six, seven, and eight were printed in Venezuela, but shipped to the U.S. and presented here. All of these books range from poetry to prose to literary interview, a genre that didn't even exist before this author. And the languages in these books go from Spanish to English so far. Some of these books are the only translations to English of these texts. Other projects we have worked on since opening the studio are chapbooks of specific texts that were not included in other larger publications or that were not relevant enough to be included in larger volumes. So we took those in and compiled them, translated them, and with the same machines that we use to test or make dummies for books for larger companies or clients, we create this little, um, publication. yeah, this little publications with short print run that allows us to put this work out there in libraries and the hands of people that really need them. Uh, number twelve and number eleven are client work and part of one of the volumes of the Carmela de Saola research that was funded partially by the ten by ten. Photo books by women grant. So um, one of the main influence for Letra Muerta's aesthetic are archive. We also tend to look for many reference of past projects regarding the subject, either from brands or context to nurture the project visually. And here are some um, manuscripts. Some of them we folded here in the studio, some of them um, not, but you could see Ida Granco's, Hanioso's, Millo Millo Vestrini's, 
and uh, Salvador Garmendia, that is uh, the little one with uh, like wineish notebook. <laughs> Yeah, and something really important is that we also take inspiration from chirography and author's handwriting to define the aesthetics or even the font choices for many of these projects. So we will try to focus only on five projects today, like I said in the beginning. Uh, the first project it will be about Cruz Diez. That's an institutional catalog. The second project is a three-volume newspaper about Carmela Lizaola. The third project is an experimental two volume book that only had 150 copies printed. The fourth book is a bilingual book with three spines, experimental from a German author, German Venezuelan author, Hani Osot. And the fifth one is a book that it's currently in process. And in between these, we'll sprinkle some extra examples that we find exciting and want to share with you. Yeah, this is the Cruzies catalog. Uh, one of the first projects we started working together uh, this catalog was for an exhibition uh, that was held at Museo Reina Sofia. Uh, Carlos Cruz Diaz was a Venezuelan kinetic artist, but the beginning of his career was on graphic design. This was a very important project because he was one of the pioneers of graphic design in Venezuela, but his work, this work, was unknown because it might not be as lucrative as his uh, paintings, installations, and his culture. And he attended to the Cristobal Rojas Art School. Here we can see how we, well, it's very obvious that we created a modular grid and we also broke it to represent part of the movement of uh, an opening of one of his multiple volume publications. This is actually Transverbales by Alfredo Silva Estrada. This was printed in France. And later on, an adaptation of this was made by John Langham. Something I didn't mention before is that we were very limited page-wise. We only had 64 pages based on the fact that the budget was limited and the printer that we had access to, the top, top amount of pages that they printed for this format was 64, which is multiples of four because it's saddle bound. Uh, so we needed to choose a font that performed really well in different point sizes. And for that, we decided to pair um, Archivo by Omnibus and Halyard by Darden Studio. This allowed us to work with different hierarchies for the folios, the image numbers, and the captions. Yeah, also they are really good for small sizes. And we well, we will show you some of the hierarchies that the text has. Um, an important criteria for this project was the information had to be placed chronological for the curator's request. That means images were in dialogue with each other all the time, but we managed to create balance with different sizes. Uh, another struggle that is that uh, all the images belong to different institutions and they needed to be credit and number uh, next to the images. Yeah, almost all of the times the images needed to be credited next to uh, or within the same page or the following page. There are many different uh, gray areas we had to explore to get permissions for the use of these images. And most of them, you know, um, require some specifics from the curator and the institutions. As Oriana said, it was five institutions, but not only five, we're five different countries. We work with an institution in Texas, uh, one institution in Panama, one institution in Paris, one institution in Venezuela. And we also got opinions from the family <laughs> of yeah. the author. Um, yeah, yeah, here you can see all, not all of them, but the main sizes that we implemented for the, uh, or the implementation of the font and the styles. Um, this publication wasn't meant to be bilingual, but since it was the first a record of Prusia's work, well, the graphic work, as I said, it was important for us including this text in English. We wanted the, his work to be know, known and studied in institutions in the US. So within the page limitation, we decided to place it at the end, uh, at the small, the smallest point size, as you saw, uh, is six, point, six points. Le and the, the smallest le letting was eight points in a three column of text. 
the text width and the width was uh, 170 millimeters. Yeah, Oriana did that on purpose. She said she didn't want to put the presentation in inches so people in the US would learn <laughs> about centimeters. <laughs> so here you can see some of the styles. We had quotations that were indented differently and had different um, uh, specifics regarding letting, point size, et cetera, body variation. Uh, the titles and again, you know, the sidebars with which were an issue and the details in the bottom. Yeah, so this is a publication that Farida mentioned before. Carmela Leisaola was the first Venezuelan woman graphic designer registered to these days. She did this work uh, with the help of the photo book, uh, 10 by 10 photo book by woman. Grant, <laughs> Grant, yeah, very important. And we also collaborated in this in this project in some in some aspects. Should I continue? Oh, leave it there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so one of the most important things is that Carmele started as a magazine designer and evolved into a newspaper designer. She dedicated her work, her whole career to editorial design. And as many of you may be familiar. Um, a lot of printed media and newspapers were seized by the government in Venezuela. So this meant that this work was not only an homage to her making, her life and her career, it was also a way to, to mark a sense of resistance through the creation of new material that would not exist otherwise in the country. So here we can see the three formats. This was also printed by Newspaper Club. Um, Concept-wise, we focus on two different types of newspaper, uh, the tabloid and the broadsheet. And the mini one, we collected, well, I collected uh, all of the images that were not order in chronological order, but were regarding a same subject, which, which was um, a focus on gender and how women were portrayed in printed media. The second, which was the tabloid, was almost all of them were real size and were actual spreads within the spreads and was one spread of each of the publications she worked on until she retired, starting with Elite Momento Magazine and ending with several newspapers. And the broadsheet, Oriana is going to discuss a little bit more about that, uh, was all formatted within um, Grafica or Graphic by commercial type which we were able to use in different point sizes to achieve different um, requirements that the layout um, conveyed. Um, Concept-wise, we reviewed her work and tried to look for elements to portray within the publication itself. This went from the use of different uh, hierarchies or point sizes, alignments, the colors, and overall the use of white space. You can see here as well um, the use of silhouettes. You can see that in the hands. This is also something that we did on the tabloid size. And um, the different use of point sizes within the back cover and the front cover. You know, so sometimes a lot of people expect that covers have the bigger point sizes for them to be read in thumbnails. So we played around a lot with the, with the sense of uh, different sizes. Yeah, and since Carmela was known for her good use of type and incorporating geometric graphic elements, we decided to incorporate these elements in the timeline. The use of imaged silhouettes, as Farida said, and rhythmic composition was one of her staples. We implemented Graphica, uh, the, the, well, uh, as you heard, the sound serif with low contrast, upper open contrast, and compact descenders, good for tight tight setting like subheads, captions, labels. As she designed all this uh, editorial and newspaper um, formats. Uh, here you can see uh, some of the uh, tags, different styles. Yeah, the different styles of the tags. Because we have the political contact in the bottom, then we have the career highlights with magenta colors, and then we have the biographical facts. So we wanted to place this uh, yeah, intercambiando, interchanging, interchanging, and um, uh, dialoguing, dialoguing between one another. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So it was really important for us to include this data in Spanish because uh, the one of the main uh, um, highlights or the highlights of this research is that it wasn't researched before. Like this, this, this Marvel's woman wasn't known for her work. And it was really important to have it in Spanish so people from Venezuela could reference it and and do more research on her work. One of the main things that led me to this research was not seeing myself represented in graphic design history, not even, obviously not the one I was taught in college because it was mostly European and, Amer and North American references, but also regarding gender, there were no role models for me from Venezuela or works that I found familiar. Uh, so in this sense, this work is not meant to be explanatory of who I am or where I come from and me trying to translate that into a U.S. audience, but to also create a resource that could be, you know, fruitful in my home country so people could know more about our own history. So besides the publication, a, Wikipa a Wikipedia page, a NISU, a website, and an exhibit were made. And we are showing this to amplify how important it is to us as a studio uh, to say that design, it's, it's not just about the format, but it's the content is important and most of all the experience around it. Yeah, we believe in many factors or moving pieces that are not necessarily linked to academia that could be, uh, that could make uh, knowledge or the learning experience meaningful for different types of understandings. Now, this is a book about Ida Gramco. Ida Gramco was born in 1924 in Puerto Cabello, Venezuela. She was mainly known uh, and acclaimed for her poetry at a very young age. But she also performed, performed as a journalist, playwright, and professor with a very extensive work of over 30 titles under her name. Now, the two photos we see here on the cover are by Carlos Puche. Both of these were printed in direct pantones. Uh, two different volumes of this book were made, um, 150 with a blue spine and 150 with a red spine. So you can see here, this book looks very fancy, but what's actually really funny is that the only reason we managed to get this type of binding besides hard work was because all of these papers were left over from other publications that were made within the printing press. So as I said, I worked with master with printer Javier Aispurua, um, and he had many years of experience. Many books were made at Ex Libris Press. So there were a lot of leftover papers. And since these books were short print runs, um, I managed to be able to make a, a dialogue between the periods of time of these texts, which were from 1947 to 1952, dividing it in five different sections of the book with five different types of paper. Yeah, and not only five different, well, five different type of paper and five different type of formats that meant that the book has five column widths and different types of text. Uh, you can see here uh, the- Some example. Yeah, some examples and on the sizes, it began with 115 millimeters and it ended with 155 millimeters. Some of the references uh, that were really important for this book came from concrete poetry, but also printed history in the country. A lot of uh, things regarding the arrival of the printing press, which is one of my main interests, um, gave me visual references for the making of this book. Some of the examples could be seen here. Uh, An Imagotipo by Tulio Febres Cordero. An Imagotipo by Tulio Febres Cordero of Simón Bolívar. Um, Foliografía by Tulio Febres Cordero from Merida, where he inked leaves and then pressed them against sheets to create a botanical record. And here we see on the right two examples, one, Versos de Salón by Nicanor Parra, a Chilean poet, and a sketch from Cecilia Vicuña, also a performance artist and Chilean poet. Oh, here, <laughs> I'm just tired already from speaking so much English. Uh, here we can see some of the examples of the chapter dividers. Um, we wanted to create sort of calligrams that portrayed what 
the titles were saying. So in the first one, we can see the first one on the left, we can see La Unidad del Llanto, which means the unity of crying. Of, uh, yeah, yes. of, of despair. The second section was about cosmogonia and birth. The third section, all the words are in vertical and there's a lot of tracking. Then the fourth one is based on repetition. And the fifth one is called El Mismo Yo Más Caracol, which is a representation of the self uh, okay. in shapes of snails um, and images regarding water since she was from El Puerto. Yeah. Here we can see how that was represented when it was printed. On the left, we can see the French fold and how the different column widths helped with the transparencies to be able to keep legibility. And on the other hand, how in some cases it was very intentional to have um, very high letting or high and higher than usual letting. So the text could be intertwined to create a sort of textile or texture, you know, texto. Um, so the poetry since it was lyrical could fully express itself on the page. Yeah, and because of the nature of this, like the most experimental par part of the book, if we were doing an analysis of the layout, uh, we could say that there are merely safety margins and very few some other indicators of text placement. We can see the folio, yes, we can see the, a grid, uh, but the main goal here was continuity and typographic experimentation. So mm -hmm. it needed some sense of um order but also the liberty of being expressive yeah this is almost a no grid book this is just safe safety margin yeah here we can see um the miniature or the second volume of the book you can see the proportion of the hand in relation to the format of the book it's really small this book wasn't even um we weren't even able to fold it with the folding machine we had to fold all the copies by hand you can see the forage is printed as well with a gradient. And this book or this volume incorporated all of the images and the text that didn't belong to a specific date or time period that we couldn't identify, but we thought were also relevant either visually or content wise for the reader to get a full experience of, or a sense of what the author's life was like. And this also allowed us to contrast different types of uh, handwritten messages from the family. And again, an homage to um, Tulio Febres Cordero in Mexico, in, uh, because there's Merida in Mexico as well. In Merida, uh, from um, Tipografía Lapis, here we can see the, the miniature. Yeah, and the font used for this book was Chaparral uh, by Carol Tomley. Uh, it was very appropriate since it's a slab series, giving it a lo low contrast quality and overall continuous stroke. And now that we're talking about Chaparral, Ta -da -da -da. yeah, jumping a little bit. This is not of part of the five deck. projects. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a um, book that we actually created in the studio, like completely. We printed and we ensemble it here. Uh, the poem is by Lynn Shapiro, the poet Lynn Shapiro. We also had the opportunity to experiment with concrete poetry. And it's not that we're trying to sell Chaparral because we actually made two proposals, one with Meriwether and the other one with Chaparral as uh, it has his, we had his history with Chaparral <laughs> and the client went with, with Chaparral. Um, here we can see some details of the typesetting. Uh, part of the playfulness or of or the type of rhythm or pacing we were seeking with these had to do with the fact that some were printed, some of the words were printing in the front and some in the back. And this is because the poem uh, had two voices or two instances. One was the drone bee and the other one was the queen bee. And this was a poem about mating. We also uh, created some different perforations so light could seep through. So there was a lot of games with opacity and transparency. And on the right, we can see one of the beautiful photographs shot by Daniela Spector in the studio, um, which was a conceptual photo shoot that we made. Here we can see some of the way the light comes through the paper overlapping and the little holes that we made, the perforation. And this is how the overall 
um, fold out looks with the laser cut cover. And this is another book uh, on Hani Osod. She was born in 1946. She studied literature and oriented herself towards German philosophy, with di deeply, which deeply influenced her work. Among others, she wrote several essays on Gego's work, who was just exhibited this year for the first time in the Guggenheim, New York. We could see it. <laughs> it yeah. was amazing. <laughs> Um, something really interesting about this book is that it was based on a 1765 Bible, but the original Bible where I took the binding idea from only had two spines and it was meant to be read on a table or in a scriptorium mode. And since this book was bilingual, I thought that it would be really interesting to narrate um, a sense of parallel between the two languages. So on the left, you can see Hani as a baby and on the right, you can see her mother. Her mother died when she was three. That's uh, what motivated most of her writing, her going back to the mother figure and the womb. And each of these portraits represented a language. So the layout is mirrored. So if you see here, um, on the left is the section in Spanish and on the right is the section in English. It was really hard to, this is only the chronology or the timeline at the end. Uh, this is not the poetic text, which were very complex. Um, but one of the main concerns here was that, uh, as you know, many of you might be familiar, Spanish is way longer than English. So we didn't want the columns to be significantly uh, longer or had too many hyphenations to interrupt reading just to make it fit with the English. So navigating that space of um kerning and uh, hyphenation for it to match was really difficult. And something that allowed us to really explore that was the use of Optima Nova, which you wouldn't think for a book with, with this time, type of literary genre, but it turned out to be amazing. And aesthetically, the qualities that it provided were very um, uh, flexible for different instances, quotations, titles, et cetera. And now, and now we're gonna talk about one of our latest babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, the name of the book is Crania by Adalbe Salas Hernandez. Uh, it's not based on Crania Americana, but we tried to create a bridge between these two texts because it's uh, as we said, we try to look for references that we can create links with for our books. And the fonts that we used for this project were Labrada by Omnibus Type, inspired from in, of indigenous cultures and oral tradition with can, classic forms. What can you tell? We like Omnibus. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, we we also like uh, fonts made by Latino. So yeah, that's yeah. Um. So this font it has so um some forms that mm -hmm. to function in immersive text and we also use public sans because we have it's bilingual we have english and spanish coexisting in this book and it was like very important to choose or implement two fonts that typographically uh could look uh very different um yeah and something conceptually is that Crania Americana the book we're referencing here is a deeply racist book it actually set the basis for many studies in medicine that continue to this day that are based on phrenology and we wanted to reappropriate uh those concepts and make them from the point of view of the people who are usually excluded from how history is written so since the book talked a lot about the perspective of, you know, our community, yeah. um, it also narrated uh, concepts of anatomy. Um, aesthetically, we want the book to look like really medical and technical. Uh, even the format of the book is relatively small. And here we can see some of the styles and yeah. treatment of folios. Yeah, and the hierarchies, uh, because each of the texts uh, was numbered. And we had polios too. So we wanted to really emphasize the difference, but still like give it that uh, look that Parida just said of medical and like, but with with sense too. And that's what we think uh, Labrada gives a lot uh, 
it gave us a lot of that to the book. Yeah, we played a lot with the column widths and some of the pages are borderline um, organic. Um, and in this sense, we wanted to create something that evoke um, many various of the books we were referencing. And in, um, I forgot what I was gonna say. Folios, oh yeah, Crania Americana had 78 texts and the manuscript we received had 82 texts. And what in the process of editing the manuscript, uh, we cut it down to 80 texts. And while formulating the concept, the graphical concept for the book, we talked to the author and decided to narrow it down to 78 to even make more emphasis on the relationship. The relationship. And one of the of the uh of the cranios <laughs> that, yeah. that are portrayed in the book actually has a bullet hole. And <laughs> It's very traumatic to see how a person from an indigenous community was included in the book like this without any sorts of regards to to the origins of that yeah. anger. Uh, another really important thing yeah. was pairing with different writing systems. So part of the books were in Greek uh, to be able to do this gracefully regarding x height and not create too much contrast or interrupt reading we did that with franklin gothic although i must confess after we sent this to the printers we found really cool options on twitter oh yeah <laughs> but it's still nice here are some examples of the labrada and public sense and of of the grid because besides there's like you you saw in the other in the other page um a lot of interactions we i think we made a really good job about the about the grid it was really important to us to play with the idea through all the book we had set styles for each language spanish was from the original manuscript and english was the result of the translator's work and at a certain point this shift uh, we wanted to emphasize that translator is also an author and the difference between translation and transliteration. And here's a little video we got from the printer. Here you can see how the spine has a progression with the title and all of the layout is based on where the signatures are sewn. Here you see Grania. All the book is of white, even the thread. The cover here, you can see the varnish. Uh, the This is a dummy, so it doesn't have the debossing yet. And then inside you see the index, the reference images, the, in the image index, and then the texts. Oh, this is a, the fun part. Yeah. So these are some of the archives that we process and digitize in the studio. We continue to focus on the importance of graphic and especially the typographic nature of this work. There are, there are associated not only with literature and design, but with printed history, political context, and our own experience. You can see here, uh, Hanioso, Millo Vestrini, Victor Vianos, and our uh, own history. Uh, something that's really important to us, like you can see here, these are video that the ratio obviously indicates that were made for social media. We are really interested in spreading the word about these authors or this work through um, uh, digital platforms, social media, newsletters, lectures, events, etc. because we believe that uh, there's room for meaningful learning experiences outside of academia as well. The fonts used for this presentation were Inga by Fercosi and Recursive Mono by Aerotype. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for sharing knowledge. Um, I, I was really inspired. And one of the questions that I was having, it was about actually using type in different languages, but you guys already uh, addressed that particular question. For me, it was really interesting understanding like the implications of like choosing a typeface depending on the language. So we have a couple of questions from, from the public. Um, this is a, actually a hard question from Sandra Garcia. Milton Glaser talks about the designer as a political actor, as a citizen who do the symbolic power that images and graphics have 
can and perhaps should be a contact actor in society. How do you reflect this activism on your work as designers? How do you work with the intersection between women, migrants, and designers? Well, I would say, first of all, I don't guide my, I think we don't guide our work philosophy through Milton Glaser's, uh, any reference regarding Milton Glaser. But if it, but we do practice uh, intersectionality. I don't know if that's how you say it in English, intersectionalidad. Um, it is very intentional. It, it's not a coincidence that most of the authors we are publishing are women. Um, and unfortunately, it has to do with the fact that most of the texts that we choose to work with are texts that were never edited in the first place or never re-edited. So it also, uh, it's a way to point out or denounce how publishing in general, design history and many spaces have been male dominated. Uh, especially with, you know, intersect with things like race uh, and uh, geographical spaces. Yeah, and this is something that we talk a lot uh, about because it's not just Fari was Fari that was mentioning the the fact on the design decisions, but in practice, we actually make events for that reason too. We make events with. Uh, we do a lot of activities, we include a lot of people, and that's why it's a collaborative space, is because we create the, the graphic design, or graphic design is not just a practice that you do in front of a computer or read, and it's also that you practice, and that you include people to- Yeah, it's to, important to create spaces. Yeah. The spaces we want to be a part of that don't exist, we make for ourselves and for others like us. Definitely agree. Uh, I don't know if Lavinia or Jimena wants to add a little bit of, of that. Um, for me, in particular, I can I can say, but for myself, um, intersectionality it's it's a huge thing in my work, but also in the way that I try to educate others. For example, in my case, I'm a Latina, I'm part of the LGBTQ community, but also I'm a woman. So it's really important how design affects every aspect of our lives. Um, thank you so much for for addressing that particular question. Go, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I want to follow up a little on that because I, what I find very interesting about your work at Letra Muerca, Muerta is that it's also archival. So it's publication as a form of archiving. And Faride, what you were saying that it has like this tone of resistance in one of the projects that you were talking about. Do you think about this actively or is this yeah, like. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it also has to do with the way I see myself, and I I don't want to speak on behalf of both of us, but yeah. I know you, you also you, you can do it. Yeah, um, of how we see ourselves as professionals in this country, um, I think that the identity part, I the gender part, yes, but the identity part is something that I think I never had to think about while I was in Venezuela. And I'm the daughter of immigrants as well. So moving to the US definitely made me realize how some of my upbringing was influenced by you know, a lot of traditions that were not Venezuelan or how the hybridity or the bridges built between languages in, in my home uh, shape the way I think or make choices. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and also this is another um it's like a personal thing that I'm gonna share, but I know I know that you're gonna be uh like fine about it. One of the things that uh linked us the most is that don't look at me like that. <laughs> is that it's not just about it's a practice, it's a practice as a as a person. Like as we do this practice in the studio, we try to do it outside the studio too. So it's part of like creating our identity, like creating a community. It's about all that and the dialogues. And I said that it was personal because when I, when I met Fari, I saw that it was, you know, bigger than just the practice. It's it's up it or the design practice. It's the practice, the practice as mm -hmm. as a. Way I of think uh, it, well, especially in the work that we do, it's work that's regarding literacy uh academia um 
literature, there are works that have to do a lot with the way you think. So that's another thing we don't want. We never get involved with projects that don't align with our those yeah. with our beliefs or our local. So we definitely want to make work that contributes to to how we want things to be uh, facing towards or the improvements we want to see in the world. And in that sense, uh, we do believe that there's a strong link between how the work or we seek the work to shape, you know, our surroundings. We have two more questions from the public, um, from Janet Bix. It says, fantastic presentation and powerful work. Uh, your books are rigorous conceptual objects. Can you talk a bit, a, a little bit more about your process of collaborating with artists, poets, and histories? Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> that's a long process. Um, so it depends. Usually we identify a void within history that we're interested about. We can't find nothing about. And that's what begins the whole process. And it main, that mainly translates in interviews, um, testimonial sources that we then have to contrast with historical documents. So most of our most of our teamwork is with historians, family members, secondary bibliographical sources, and as you saw, newspapers. So that makes our work really hard because uh, there's no infrastructure currently that supports the maintenance of these archives, and that's. What part of the work we're trying to do here is about preserving, restoring, uh, digitizing, and making available for people. You know, if you don't uh, catalog, digitize, photograph, talk about uh, these people are dead. They're they're people are not talking about them. They're not being referenced. They're not being studied. So our our efforts are in accessibility, making this material available for others, and creating more points of view. Yeah, and I think the technical aspect for how we collaborate, Parida that says something really important on our process is like finding a void. We're like very creative in the sense that we start throwing ideas through there and then we say, okay, but we don't know how to do this. So who can help us doing it? Uh, for example, in the Lynn Shapiro book that we, we uh, made here in the studio, we had like this marvelous ideas and we were like, okay, but how can we do the uh, the holes for, how can we do the cover? And we wanna do this, but we don't have this machine here. So, and we started collaborating with many people. Yeah, one of the people we collaborate is uh, an architect, a woman from Venezuela, her name is Liz Morles. Uh, we created a dummy and then she, while we took on other projects, it continued to reproduce and do all the binding for the rest of the 150 copies. Uh, Nicole Aptekar yeah, also did yeah. the, um, uh, the laser cutting. So we did that in several parts and then bound them together. We went um, to the CBA too. Well, yeah, we guillotine at CBA. Oriana, my husband and I did the, the die cutting. Uh, it was a team effort, you know, yeah. there's a, and those kind of projects are not that common. We usually work a lot with offset printing and more uh, la larger print runs or projects that tend to be more high transit or high distribution. But we're always really interested in including, you know, these little Easter eggs or works that break the the monotonous or the, yeah. or, you know, if yeah. things feel stuck, we always look for weird projects because we also like learning you know and collaborating means learn from other people that know better how like how to um materialize something and in that process we're like oh this is how you do the die cut or hey this is how you do this uh and we love that yeah and one of the things i like i love about working with you is oriana is like the young one so <laughs> she always has such good ideas and techniques for things are you too you i'm know? not young no well I, i'm not gonna say that you're not young in public what are you talking about we don't need to say ages just saying we don't have to say ages we don't have to say ages. I'm not but young. it but it's beautiful that you can enhance your work um with, with a collaboration like it, it it adds so much value and like I don't know it's it's just so beautiful to interact with people that adds like uh the special touch i would say the secret sauce 
so everything <laughs> gets better. <laughs> Something so, that I think is not talked about enough is that a book is not a one person project. Mm. There's a lot of like these icons and figures in book design, and you never stop to realize that there's a work of tens and dozens of people to make a book come to life from the editor to the proofreader, the author. Now, the author doesn't have a book. The author has a manuscript. So all of these processes is a constant dialogue and collaboration. So I think that's one of the things we like the most about books. books yeah. um, we also love reading in literature. Oriana writes, for example, and I don't write. Um, you write. <laughs> so... Um, so I think books is one of the spaces in design world where all of these collaboration conflates um, the most. Definitely, I I can I can think about like how many people are involved in a book as the as many pages has. Like you can you can have a lot of people involved on, on one production. Um, we have one more question from the public, Mauricio Villamayor. Um, when selecting types for a project, do you consider other aspects beyond aesthetics and functionality? For example, choosing a type to give visibility to a certain movement, the type was part of the type designer themselves. Wow. Huge yeah. questions over here. <laughs> uh, well, it's Mauricio. He's very a very smart person. So I assume he was going to ask a question like that. Um, so yes, there are several aspects besides aesthetics. Um, the main thing or the first thing that we look for is based uh, the amount of languages or writing systems that we're working with. So we need, we're girls that need their diacritics. <laughs> we're working with Spanish. We're working with different languages. We we're very demanding regarding diacritics. So that's one thing. Uh, we also need to know the nature of the text. So yes, if we have quotations, we need body variations. If we need small point sizes. So sometimes it's really hard um, to kind of balance <laughs> that area between the aesthetic we're looking for and how the color of the page is gonna look or what the language or author requirements are. Um, but we do focus a lot on visibility. Uh, we also have a selection, a secret selection of secret sauce uh, of um, Latina uh, fonts made by Latinas, fonts yeah. made in Latin America. Um, we also try to support independent foundries. Um, we also work with custom stuff. We have worked with Mirko Velimirovic and we're currently working with surprise, surprise guests that we'll discuss <laughs> later. So there's, you know, a little bit of everything in the process, you know, and that's what makes it fun. Yeah, well, definitely. thank you so much. No, go ahead. Very cool. I, don't know. I, I didn't know if you were waiting for me to say something, but yeah, uh, one of the, we are like really tough on choosing that because it's, we definitely want that functionality, but we also want to uh, bring um, type settings that are made by women, by Latinos. I mean, it's not the only ones that we use, but we, we research on that too to choose or i also feel like there's a huge thing to point out is that we didn't have as many options when we were in venezuela uh we didn't have access yeah. to purchase or pay for certain licenses or the internet connection was not stable we didn't have access to the same courses lectures or you know resources we do have now so that also has allowed us to you know, expand uh, our horizons in regards of choosing fonts. I think it's also really important that um, there are many efforts, well, not many, but there's some efforts happening regarding giving visibility to people that we're not usually given visibility to, like, for example, yeah. these lecture series, and that allows to create resources or references that people can rely on when making these kind of projects. This is amazing. Thank you so much, Farida and Ariana. It has been amazing sharing knowledge and learn from you guys. Um, Lavinia and Jimena, last words before we go. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this lovely, lovely presentation. Uh, just a quick note. Um, what struck me is your involvement with the materiality and how you use that to honor uh, to honor the subject um, that you're working on. Um, so it was very nice to see you describe how do you how you approach that in your work. 
Any final thoughts? No, same. Well, thank you, Oriana, Laishi. Thank you for being our lovely host. Um, and thank you to everybody who came to our lecture, to our second session of Mujeres Hispanas y Tipografía. And we hope to see you on Thursday for the last session of the series. I know we had said this in the beginning, but we had admired the series since we saw it. And the catalog is a huge reference in our studio. So being part of this has been a huge honor Thank for us. Anna, yes. Gracias. Such an honor to hear you yeah. say that. And you're perfect for it. Like everything that you talked about today is exactly what we want to be talking about in this type of space. So thank you for sharing your work and your point of view. It was we need. We need more of you guys. <laughs> we need more. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. See you on the next one, everyone.